Amen. Come on, give some God some more praise. Amen. Amen. God bless them. Start my life over again. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to call all of our attentions back to the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter. situation we try to do our best, but sometimes we just get into it. I'm praying, Lord, that whatever that issue may be in that brother, that sister, that family, that marriage, or on the work site, or even in the neighborhood it might be, that you'll speak a word this morning where lives can be touched and changed and empowered. <coughs> and pray, Lord, that you will speak a word that, that will help us. That will help us to not keep falling short where we do have to keep cleaning our lives up over and over again. I pray now, Lord, that you will use me and that you will use us in this word-sharing moment. In the name of Jesus, we pray and give thanks. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. If you look with me in the Gospel of Matthew, 5th chapter, verses 43 through 45, we find the following for our hearing. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Bless them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and send it rain on the just and also the unjust. For a fault this hour, whatever you're going through, he can make you stronger. Amen. Oh yes, he will. Whatever you did, God can make you stronger. Everybody in 1960s did not agree with Dr. Martin Luther King's nonviolent principles when it came to fighting for full human rights and full citizenship. There were folk like Stokely Carmichael and Malcolm X and Angela Davis and H. Rapp Brown that were not against peace, but just believe that peace was not the answer. The 1880s revealed that leaders such as Nat Turner and even earlier, Denmark Vesey became tired of waiting for somebody to take off the chain. They believed that masters needed some of his own inhumane, torturous, and corruptible medicine. So they killed the masters and burned their homes and destroyed the plantation. Needless to say, Vesey was called planning and Turner called burning and he was lynched. And there were those that believed that in order to gain respect, civil rights and job opportunities and life privileges, that violence should be an option on the table when one man feels that he can take away your freedom, your family, and your livelihood. Listen, church, 
As a black leader, I struggle, and even many folks across the world, that this non-violent approach seems to be real costly. It cost it so much that Dr. King was assassinated. His wife became a widow girl in life, and children were left without a father. James Meredith was marching peaceably for voting rights and was shot down in the middle of the street. Sam Cooke was offering music that was becoming more social conscious, music that crossed over to the mainstream and reminded the nation of its hypocritical nature. He was shot and killed. Some of you may recall the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing where Addie and Carol and Cynthia and Carol were the little girls, the four black girls we hear about, were killed. The Selma March, known as Bloody Sunday, where countless of people were tear gassed and jailed and shot and beaten and murdered for all of us to have rights, while the nonviolent movement was at its height. Now, there may be a times when self-defense is in order, and you are required to defend your life, your spouse, your children, and your home. However, there are times when we deal with situations that can be avoided. You really don't have to get into it because you were cut off at the red light. You really don't have to get into it because the woman broke in front of the line at the grocery store. You really don't have to get into it because the waiter brought you the wrong food and the wrong drink and even charged you the wrong amount. There are times, brothers and sisters, when we carry on and it looks as if we don't even know nothing about the Lord. There are times when non-violence and non-combative and non-aggressive approaches, they would work better. Some of us just might be present this morning and you're dealing with certain issues that you want to handle and need to address or resist or even confront. And handling your situation with no violence may not appeal to your conscience. It may not make sense because of what happened to you and who did what. It may not make you feel that things will be properly resolved by the authorities. You may even feel that it may not be taken care of. You might want to do what they did to you. You might want to get some get back and some payback. You might want to let some folk how you, you might want to let them know how you really feel or what's going on in your head and what's going on in your spirit because of the damage that they have caused you and caused your livelihood and caused your family and even caused your life. But if you adopt the same spirit as your attacker, the same spirit as the one that oppresses you or abuses you, the one that mistreated you or dogged you or walked over you, then you will take on the likeness of the individual. You will take on the likeness of their spirit. You will allow them to control your life even when they're no longer in your life. It makes you no difference what they've done and not done. And you may not even want to hear about taking a high road, or you may not want to hear about morality or, or doing good or what even would Jesus do. But there is something to be said when good outweighs evil. There is something to be said when living right outweighs evil. There is something to be said when you learn how to live for the Lord when you're dealing with certain issues and trials and tribulation. There is something to be said when you know how to live in the Lord when things don't look right and, the, and you're really trying to trust and wait on God. But you need to realize that when you trust in God and you live in God, waiting on God will pay off after a while. And something about when you live for Jesus, yes, you got to get out and vote, yes. There are times when you need to speak out and you need to speak up, yes. There are times for marches and times for filing complaints and standing for your rights and the rights of others. But, but when you do it, do it all in the name of Jesus. When you speak, you do it in the name of Jesus. Don't need Jesus out. Don't need Jesus a peacemaker out. Don't need the Savior out. Don't. Don't need the redeemer out. Don't need the waymaker out. Don't need them who's able to do what you can't do on your own out of your life. He can 
make you strong. And the backdrop of Matthew chapter 5 is a sermon that Jesus preached to a multitude of people on the hillside of a lake known as the Sea of Galilee. And when you go back and look at the King James Version, Jesus tells the crowd of people, he said, ye have heard. In other words, this is not new information. You've heard about the traditions and practices of loving your neighbor, and you've been taught to hate your enemies. You've heard the teachers of how you were taught to love, but to love only your own kind. They were not taught that their neighbor was someone the way we would think, someone to include within their culture. They were taught a love that was an isolated love. The type of love that only applied to those that existed within their specific group. They did not teach inclusivity and diversity. And there are groups that are still among us, brothers and sisters, that believe and practice an isolated type of love. A love that teaches that other folk are not worth being loved. And we must be careful as believers of adopting a love that is not a love at all. We must be careful of how we treat foster children. We must be careful of how we treat women because they have X amount of children. We must be careful of how we treat adopted children and even how we treat wayward children. We must be careful of how we treat folk that don't look like us and don't smell like us and don't dress like us and don't live like us. We must be careful of adopting an isolated and elitist and trumpist. We must be careful of a divisive and exclusive and isolated kind of love that embraces that other individuals and families and cultures should not exist. We must be careful as God's children of pretending that God can only love certain folk, but he can't love other folk when the Bible that we read said that God, so God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah. This embracing and loving of one's own ethnicity taught them to accept hate as a method of survival and building community. In their case, Jesus was speaking primarily to Jews in a non-Jew was viewed as a Gentile. And throughout the scripture, Gentiles, unless they became a proselyte, say that with me, proselyte. A proselyte was a person that was converted to Judaism. But these folk that were non-Jews were viewed as heathens. A heathen would be equated to a person that would have a lost soul. A lost race of people, unacceptable and unworthy of even being alive, unworthy of even having the goodness of God. There are reports right now when you read the news that hate groups have actually increased in the past three years. There are hate groups against blacks and hate groups against Hispanics and hate groups against homo and transsexuals and hate groups against political parties and hate groups against refugees, hate groups against immigrants, hate groups against foreigners, where people's lives are being threatened and murdered, even while we sit in church. After 2,000 years, a person could think that civilization has moved far past only loving their own kind. But this 21st century of technology and modern conveniences and global connectedness reveals to us that hatred has not gone away. The 21st century where we could think that we're more civilized, that we're non-barbaric, reveals that we're still on the plantation. It reveals that slavery has not gone away, that oppression has not gone away. They're treating folk wrong because they don't think the same or look the same or live the same, have not gone away. There are women that are still being abused. There are children that are still being trafficked and, and being mistreated. All around us, there are people that have hate in their hearts and don't believe that other folk deserve to have a full life. Last week in the news, a Coast Guard officer 
by the name of Christopher Hansen was found with a stockpile of weapons with a manifesto to kill Democrats and celebrities and he had homework on how to destroy the food supply and annihilate not some people but the entire human race. There's an author down in Alabama by the name of Goodloe Sutton, a publisher of an Alabama paper who was just quoted last this month in February saying it's time for the Ku Klux Klan to ride again, to ride and lynch, and to kill certain groups of individuals. And whether you realize it or not, even in Alabama and Mississippi, even right now, there are still people that are being lynched. They're afraid to put it on the news so that you will know the real truth of what's going on. There are, there are people in this day and age who will do you in. There are people who will prey on you. There are people that will look down on you. There are people that will belittle you. There are people that will ostracize you. There are people that will minimize you. There are people that will discriminate against you. It don't make no difference what you drive and what you wear and how much you own. There are people who will take your life. But violence of hate news, no matter who they are, in the name of loving one's own kind, is not love. Paul said that love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, 4, does not behave itself unseen, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, and thinketh no evil. When folk are using violence, no matter who they are and who you are, Jesus said in John 15 and 12, this is my commandment. This is what Jesus said. He said, you love one another as I have loved you. If people really love one another. I'm not talking about no Republican and no Democrat and no Libertarian and all these other parties. But if folk were to love one another, our nation would be better. If people really were to love one another, the family would be falling apart. If people really love one another, a husband would love his wife. A wife would love her husband. Parents would love their children. Children would love their parents. Neighbors will love one another. Yeah. Brothers and sisters and sisters and brothers will love one another. Yeah. And even church members that call themselves children of God, they will love one another. In contrast to their traditional teachings, Jesus gives this one verse that I want to leave with you. It's Matthew 5 and 44. He said, but I say unto you, he said, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. He was giving them a new teaching, a new understanding. He was giving them tools that would bring about a change. He said, Love your enemies. Bless those whose words are not kind to you. And pray for those that have done you wrong. These words of Jesus are so contrary to our, to our human nature. That really, brothers and sisters, it does not make any sense. He said, love your enemy. Even if you wanted to love your enemy, how do you love someone that there is nothing to love them for? How do you love somebody that has abused and accused and only used you up? The type of individual that has made up in his or her mind that you don't matter or you don't count or you should not exist. See, when Stephen was being stoned to death in Acts, Luke said that he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. The people were stoning him to death and mistreating him. And he said, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he says this, the word said he fell asleep. Even Dr. Martin Luther King promoted his nonviolent philosophy where nonviolent training would take place. People would practice getting hit and practice getting yelled at and practice getting food dumped on them and practice getting pushed around and kicked around and then have a good spirit about the whole matter. Now don't get it twisted. 
We're not saying that you allow people to abuse you and, and to mistreat you. We're not even saying that you ought to re-enter a bad relationship or re-enter abuse and combative and screwed up relationships. What King was saying to us as an oppressed people, that love was all that we had. We didn't have an army to go out and fight toe-to-toe. -to -toe. We didn't have mass weapons of destruction. We didn't have any more lives to waste of violence and criminal activity. But he saw a way to promote the power of love. When people can't love you, sometimes you gotta show them how to love you. When people don't know how to talk, you gotta show them how to talk. When people don't know how to act, you gotta show them how to act. Sometimes you gotta show them how to lead. Sometimes you gotta show them how to deal with situations so that they don't keep getting themselves into trouble. What we're saying is there are power in love. Yeah. Secondly, Jesus turns around and deals with the language, the choice of words of the people. When he said, bless them, that curse you. Wow. He was saying that there are times when you have done no wrong. You have done nobody no harm. Yet there are some people that find pleasure in cussing you out. You know I'm going to tell it. And to be cursed out is how a person just keeps on insulting you and putting you down and calling you outside of your name. But Paul said in Colossians 4 and 6, let your speech be always with grace. Season with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every person. Even Jesus said in the gospel of Matthew 12 and 36, But I say unto you that every idle word that men and women shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. I know sometimes we, we feel that we big and bad and we can say what we want to say and we can talk to who we want to talk to any kind of way. We do it in the church, and then what we don't say before church, we get in the parking lot after the benediction to say what we want to say. We get on the phone, and we call people, and we say things, and, and then it may not be verbal, and sometimes we text and email things thinking that, and put false names behind it, and won't use our real name as though God is not watching us, but God is watching you. Even all the word tells you that there are times when, when you're confronted by somebody that will just cuss you out. And even when you pray to do right yourself, when you've been on your best behavior, even when you feel like saying some words too, there are always somebody that want to curse you out, that want to insult you, and that want to low rate you and berate you. And, and guess what Jesus said? He said, you got a blessing. Every time they say what they say, you don't have to get fired up. Just bless it. You don't have to be mad. Just bless it. You don't have to get upset. Just bless it. You don't have to become fragile. Just bless it. You don't have to be confused and frustrated. You don't have to fall apart. You don't have to lower your standards. Just bless it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord bless you and help you. May the Lord bless you and have mercy upon your soul. You don't have ugly because somebody else get ugly. Just bless Finally, everything that Jesus is teaching the people seems as if it is opposite what a person would normally do. He said, love the enemies. When often we are taught to fight, or we say we ain't going to put up with this, or we want to destroy them, it's something that we would not normally do. Then he turned around and said, bless them that curse you. When often we, we teach that if you, you curse me out, you know what I'm getting ready to say. <laughs> then I can curse you out. And then he turned around and said, do good to those that hate you. When many people are hated, they, they hate in return. And now he's saying, pray, oh Lord, thank you. Pray for folk that not only use you, but despitefully use and persecute you. Despitefully combined with being persecuted is to describe the kind of individual that just won't leave you alone. 
The kind of person that, that will stalk you. The kind of person that will come after you. The kind of person that will hunt you down. Some years ago, I went on a visitation. And before I got out of the car, I always look around for dogs. Because dogs, you got some dogs that are loud and then some dogs are sneaky. That's a whole other message. But they'll sneak up and bout you on your ankle. And I looked around and then seeing the dogs around, but I noticed across the street a yard full of people drinking and talking loudly. All of a sudden, two people got into it. Be careful hanging around folk that like to drink a lot. It always ended up being something else. One guy pushed another guy. He kept on pushing. I'm sitting in the car wash right in the street. Broad daylight, kept on pushing, kept on pushing. Next minute you know the brother got tired of him pushing. And guess what? He jumped on him. Sometimes there are folk in your life that just keep on pushing. Keep on pushing and keep on pushing. And you get tired sometimes, don't you? I said I was going to tell you. You get tired sometimes, don't you? Get tired of the mess and tired of, of the talking and tired of the putting up with it. And, and they keep on talking and keep on talking. And all the while, it's in your mind to jump. Your last nerve has been hit. It's in your mind to go and get something. In your mind to throw a punch or to throw a fit. It's in your mind to even throw them down. It's in your mind to lift your leg or to kick out your feet. And sometimes in your mind, you want to pull out a weapon. You want to go get a taser or you want to get a gun or you want to get a knife. And you don't care if it's the butcher knife, the steak knife, the pocket knife, or the butter knife. You want to go and get something to deal with your situation. But here Jesus is saying, don't, don't jump. Don't blow a fuse. Don't set it off. He said, pray. But, but what kind of prayer is this when you're being persecuted? What kind of prayer do one do when folk are talking about you? What kind of prayer do you pray when people are putting you down? What kind of prayer is in order when, when you've been fired from a job and don't know why you've been fired? What kind of prayer takes place when, when you've been insulted? What kind of prayer takes place when you've been abused? What kind of prayer takes place when you've been falsely accused? When you've been walked on like a piece of dirt and walked over like a doormat, used like a dirty sponge, thrown away like a dirty rag? What kind of prayer? It's the kind of prayer that helps you realize be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. It's the kind of prayer that helps you realize that God in his own time will make your enemy your footstool. It's the kind of prayer that helps you realize that all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord according to his purpose. It's the kind of prayer that helps you realize greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. See, there's something about this kind of prayer that'll help you when you can't help yourself. You might want to jump, but Jesus said love. He said bless, and he said pray. You might want to start something, but Jesus said to love. He said to bless, and he said to pray. You might want to swing. You might want to low. You might want to cock. You might want to pull. You might want to yank. You might want to snatch, but Jesus said love. He said bless and he said pray. He said love, bless and pray. Because God has something great. God has something better. God has something strong. He said love. He said bless and he said pray. Because God has something greater for you. God has something better for you. God has something stronger for you. Stronger than when you've been mistreated. Stronger than when you've been put down. Stronger than when you've been let down. He has something stronger than degradation. Stronger than discrimination. He has something stronger when everything else has failed. He has something stronger when everything you tried did not work this time. Did not work last time. Did not work the other time. Stronger when the insults come. Stronger when the cussing come. Stronger when the finger pointing come. 
He can make you great. He can make you better. He can make you strong. He can make you stronger than an American gladiator. Stronger than an American ninja. He can make you stronger than a titan. He can make you stronger than a warrior. Because he is the Lord our God. He is the I am that I am. He is the Lord our God. He is the beginning to the end. He is the Lord our God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Lord our God. He Genesis the Revelation. He is our Lord and God. From birth to the life, to the crucifixion to the cross. He's a cross-bearing God. He's a resurrected God. What he did last time, he can do it again. What he did in the past, he can do it right now. Did he not get you up this morning? Did he not keep bread on the table? Did he not keep clothes on your back? Did he not keep a roof over your head? If he did it one time, he can do it again. He can make you better. He can make you great. He can make you strong. But you gotta trust in the Lord.